short story that I wrote in my first career, which was as a French teacher to elementary school students. So, bonjour, class. En automne, en septembre, un groupe de musiciens participe à un pique-nique. Ils s'amusent avec leurs instruments, le violon, la trompette, les cymbales, etc. Oh là Soudainement, un monstre horrible arrive. Les musiciens sont terrifiés. Le monstre approche et applaudit. Il adore la musique. Quelle surprise We'll come back to that. Ah. I am no longer a French teacher. These days, I am an iOS developer and also a mentor for companies whose mobile devs need kind of more coaching than the companies themselves can really provide. It's the most rewarding thing that I do. And so if you haven't mentored uh, junior or mid-level devs in a while, I really recommend giving it a go. Today, we're talking about readable code. But in my old role as a foreign language teacher and my new role as a code author and coach, I've noticed an awful lot of parallels. Uh, foreign language learning is a rich area to inform the <laughs> words that we choose in developing software. So in terms of Explore DDD, I fit in here, refining language. This, this talk is about choosing words. So we'll talk through what readable code even is, then why you would want to write it, and once you're convinced that you should, we'll move on to how you might begin, and finally, when you might want to. Now, you might have more experience learning languages than writing code or vice versa, so I'm going to illustrate examples of both to really help strengthen that connection. When you first do something in a new computer language, <laughs> it works, something prints, you feel like a demigod. And similarly, maybe after a couple of weeks of studying a new human language, you work up your courage and you ask maybe a cute classmate, you and me, today after class, coffee? <laughs> and they answer, oh no, I'm sorry, today I'm busy after class. And you do a little fist pump because you asked if they could meet after class. They said they're busy after class. They understood you. It worked. <laughs> so you're so encouraged, maybe you keep building on that success. Uh, to continue with the human language scenario, maybe after another few weeks of studying, you bravely ask a different classmate to coffee, and they say yes, and then you go and you spend 10 minutes over your lattes describing how is the weather today, and talking about I have one sister and one brother. And maybe if you're feeling very confident in your past tense, what did you do last weekend? And it is a really boring conversation, but you leave the meeting feeling amazing because you understood each other for multiple sentences in a row. It's like if you get data to display in a table view in an iOS app, or maybe you set up your server and you send it your custom request and you get your custom response. Yes, it, it's not glamorous, right? But the first time you did it, you got a little dopamine hit. I know you did. Now back to human languages. Now maybe you've been studying for years and you're really fluent. If you go on a date with somebody, you're not thinking about your grammar, you're thinking about whether you chose the right restaurant. And then maybe over appetizers, you realize every time you mention one of your interests, they interrupt you to explain their completely uninformed but very confident views on the subject. And even though you understand each other perfectly well, you clearly have incompatible purposes in this conversation. Now for code, this is like maybe interviewing a job candidate for a back-end position, and they talk brilliantly about implementation details, and things are going really well, and then you ask them to talk through a particular task for your business goals at a high level. And they kind of scoff and say, are you kidding? That's for front-end developers. I'm, I'm a back-end engineer. We don't have users. And now the fact that their code runs just became kind of irrelevant because this is an extreme mismatch with your company's values. As we develop fluency in both human and programming languages, we start leaving these basics behind and we become more attuned to the nuance and subtlety, which sounds like a good thing, not always, because we might understand someone perfectly and hypothetically agree with their meaning, but then something in this highly tuned information processing system picks up the lightest notes of an impression based on just something in their tone, 
and spits out a judgment based on some deeply held bias. Uh, for example, people in the US will say, oh, I don't think people from the South are stupid or lazy. No, 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 I just think the Southern accent sounds stupid and lazy. <laughs> Have you ever held a belief about an accent that didn't also match some deeply held stereotype about the people who use that accent? Uh, but these sorts of stereotypes and biases, they carry over to programming languages too, right? Even maybe you personally have a pragmatic wisdom around language and framework trends. Let's say you'll bring in an outside speaker for a lunchtime brown bag. There's probably people on your team who will either roll their eyes and tune out or sit up and hang on to every word based solely on the tech stack that the speaker identifies with, even if their content is about something completely different. People's biases can affect their learning. Now, we also bring a lot of expectations to code and language. Sometimes those expectations even work against us. Uh, for example, being fluent in a second human language can make it easier to learn maybe the basics in a third. It's not surprising when there's subject versus topic markers in Korean because you already learned them in Japanese. But fluency in one language doesn't really become fluency in another. It can actually make it harder to get to the point where something just sounds right because you know that in this other context, it's perfectly fine. For example, for uh, a human language, usually one of the first things that we learn in another language is thank you. Americans, when, when we're being polite, we say thank you a lot. Like I ask my mom to pass the pepper at dinner, she hands it over, I say thanks mom. I get on the bus, I tap my card, and I say thank, and the bus driver says, oh, thank you. But in some languages, it is ridiculous to thank somebody in those contexts because thank you, the phrase implies, wow, I am really grateful to you for going to that effort. And can you imagine if you paid your bus fare and the bus driver said, may I just say that is a marvelous thing that you just did there. Like, a beep, yeah, okay, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> and for a code example, it's kind of like if, you're, if you use a, a for in loop in Swift to modify every element of an array, like you can write this, it'll work, but for a fluent Swift writer, it looks a little odd. Swift really wants you to write it more like this. They took out the C style for loops to try to encourage us even more. If you modify a collection with a for loop, yeah, you look like a non-fluent Swift speaker. So that is my overview for parallels between human language and code. So readability. Most of us would say, without hesitation, we would love to spend our days working with readable code. Uh, I think it's not an uncommon value even to, if you have to stack readability and functionality to say, you know, I'd rather have code that's broken but that I understand because I'll probably fix it because if I have code that's incomprehensible but somehow mysteriously works, guaranteed I am going to break it. Which brings us to the first question. So what does readable code even mean? I'd like to lead in with a story. One time I witnessed a conversation between two developers over a code review. The first person said, oh, could we change this pattern? I'm having trouble understanding it. To which the other replied, no, see, it's more readable this way. <laughs> yeah, let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> in English, we can describe something as readable or enjoyable without actually defining who or what is, is doing the reading or the enjoying. Sometimes it's obvious that it's really a subjective judgment. If you ask, is LA an enjoyable city? You can say like, well, it, it depends, for, for who? But for reading, we'll say a lot of times, oh yeah, this code is readable, this pattern's clear. We imagine it somehow means something without specifying a reader. And there are as many opinions about what makes readable code as there are people who code. Some people love their single letter variable and type names because they want to really highlight the structure and control flow. They'll chain method calls together. They might write a 20 line function where the first word in the body is return and then it map filter concats its way all the way through its input parameters. And other people like being a bit more verbose, they want you to know the precise identity of each thing at each step. They'll build things up one at a time. Name each one, do a little work, name that result, combine it with another named result, and return at the end where God intended. 
But see, it's more readable this way. Now, we each also have different strengths and different contexts. It's easiest to see when you're, uh, again, learning a, a new human language. A nurse in the US might know basic medical Spanish, but can't ask about the weather. A tourist shopping in Martinique might be able to negotiate a price in French, but they can't spell. Why would you learn the alphabet? I, I went to Jaipur and realized that I'd mostly learned Hindi from Bollywood, so I could tell my taxi driver, Teri ankle me, which means there is a strange beauty in your eyes. But I couldn't say, stop the car, here is my hotel. <laughs> and so while using like a factory class might seem obvious to someone with a Java background, it's going to seem convoluted or bloated to someone who's not familiar with those practices. I've heard more than one person say, you know, after learning Haskell, you really appreciate how elegant this extremely concise way of describing this thing is. And some of you are inwardly laughing, like, oh yeah, sure, all I have to do is learn Haskell in order to understand this part of the program that's not in Haskell. And some of the rest of you are inwardly nodding, because it's, it's true. It really is beautifully clear after you learn some Haskell. Readability depends on the reader. But it gets worse, because not only do we all disagree on what readable code is, but even if we were only ever writing for one other person to read, future us, as developers, we are still writing to com two completely different audiences. One, this human brain with its eyeballs, screen reader, it's all its baggage and biases trying to make sense of these words on the screen. And the other is the computer that's running through her files and executing all their instructions. And the computer has really loud and very strong opinions about whether it understands our code or not. And since the computer gets so persnickety, it's so full of complaints, when it gets confused as developers, we kind of mostly orient ourselves to the computer. It, more of us than we would maybe like to have admit have sometimes fiddled with a line of code until it did exactly what we wanted to, then lifted our hands off the keyboard and backed away and vowed to never touch that line again prioritizing the computer audience over the human one. Now we try sometimes to make things better by surrounding the computer readable code with text that's meant only for humans with our, our comments. So this is a helpful comment. <laughs> Until someone refactors, and now the next person to read this will say, you know, I don't know what this means, but it is definitely important, so I'm going to leave it. <laughs> so it stays around, and it makes less and less sense as the program evolves around it. And we also can't depend on comments, because you know that people will take the working bits of code that you've designed, and they're just going to use them however they think makes sense. It's kind of like when you get maybe a new hair dryer. You don't read the manual first. You just start pushing buttons, even if it has a million different settings, you're like, oh, I think I know what this means. It'll be fine. It doesn't matter how many times the manual might say important and always and never. <laughs> People are just going to take the thing that you hand them and start using it. So it's really helpful to make sure the buttons do kind of what you would expect out of the box. It would be nice if you could tape the most important code comments to your functions the way the most important warnings get taped to the cord of the hairdryer. Don't take it in the bathtub. But we can't. We can't comment our way to readable code. So let's try defining readable code from another angle, because it turns out even though we have all these different levels of fluency, we do all depend on the same skills to read. We use working memory. Uh, working memory, if you're not familiar with it, is an extremely short-term store of limited size. It's five to seven things. It's that thing that lets you remember a phone number long enough to type it into a new contact field and then never remember their phone number again. Or when you're first learning to read in a new alphabet, it lets you remember the letters that you decoded at the beginning of the word long enough to make it all the way to the end. Working memory holds on to stuff for about as long as you're, re as you're using it, but once you direct your attention elsewhere, it starts to decay. So that means that if you have two things in your head, but you have to go look up number three, you're going to start forgetting one and two before you have a chance of getting to four and five. You might be a little bit skeptical, saying, well, I read things that are longer than five or seven letters all the time. I don't know if anyone here speaks German uh, or codes for Apple. <laughs> but, <laughs> but how does this work? How do we read long words? 
Uh, so we do this by a process that cognitive scientists call chunking. Chunking is when you take a bunch of primitive things like letters and group them into a single thing like a syllable or a word and then you just have to remember the group as one thing and that gives you some of those working memory slots back. So that's how we understand meaning from text, whether it's language or code. You start from the pieces you understand, build them up into more abstract pieces that you also understand. Eventually, you grasp more of the problem. And in code, we come across unfamiliar words or symbols all the time, right? There's functions whose purposes we aren't familiar with. There's variables that come from who knows where. And when we need to, we stop and look them up one by one in the docs and the source code. And sometimes we end up down a bit of a rabbit hole because that unearths something else that confuses us further and we keep going and keep going, finally find ourselves on solid ground and hopefully remember what question we were trying to solve in the first place. Uh, I want to illustrate deciphering with another human language ex example with a, a continuation of the arts that Jessica started uh, before lunch. This is part of a poem, a couple lines from When Serpents Bargain for the Right to Squirm by E.E. E. Cummings. When serpents bargain for the right to squirm and the sun strikes to gain a living wage, when thorns regard their roses with alarm and rainbows are insured against old age, then we'll believe in that incredible unanimal mankind and not until. I'll read it again. When serpents bargain for the right to squirm and the sun strikes to gain a living wage, when thorns regard their roses with alarm and rainbows are insured against old age, then we'll believe in that incredible unanimal mankind and not until. So these are all words that you know or could easily look up if you needed to, but what does that mean? Now, there, there is something really delightfully unsettling here. There's a meaning that slips away until we read and reread and reread, and then something shifts and a pattern falls out, and, and we start to, to really grasp it more. And when it does, it feels so satisfying. It took me about 10 times reading this poem before I started to understand it, so if you're still feeling puzzled, don't, don't worry. I am extremely confident that you can all understand this poem if you research and study, maybe read an outside analysis. That's part of a developer's job, right? We put in the time, we put in the effort, especially with good tools. You're gonna decipher the meaning, I know you will. But this talk is not about decipherable code. The, the only code that you truly can't decipher should be code that is actual ciphers, code that is literally encrypted. Everything else, eventually, we will be able to decipher. And deciphering and reading, they're not the same. Deci this needing to stop and search in a reference guide every couple of lines, it takes huge amounts of energy. Most of us need special circumstances to be able to do it. We need quiet space, we need uninterrupted focus. We need reasonable blood sugar levels, we can't be too hungry. I don't know about you, I really need to have had a good night's sleep. I had a kid last year, and if the baby has had a rough night, the next day at work, the only way that I cope is by literally writing down every single question that I have and every hypothesis that I develop, because otherwise I'm gonna navigate to a part of the source code and build and run, because Swift is still a little, compiling's a little slow, and I'll forget what I was doing in the first place. Short-term memory and working memory, they're finite for everyone, but with a lack of sleep, they are destroyed. But as, as long as you've got some thread to pull on to start understanding something that you're deciphering, uh, rereading a poem, even diving into really dense code, it can be really fulfilling. Uh, but I would argue that this kind of poetic economy of language where you have to read and study 10 times to get that satisfying feeling of understanding a deeper beauty, that is no place in production software. In production software, what we want is the sparse, immediate poetry of warning signs where the more important and urgent the message, the quicker it is to understand. Reading happens when you can't stop yourself from understanding something. That's why people send images like this as, as a joke, because if I ask you what colors the ones on the left are, the part of your brain that reads wants to answer first. And, and it's wrong. 
It's hard in English on the left. I would guess for most of you, it's pretty easy in Dutch on the right. So what is readable code to me? It's code that you can understand quickly and correctly without taxing the limits of your working memory. But why? Why would we want readable code? We might not like code that's hard to read. We might need to have a good night's sleep in order to do it. But isn't interpreting code just another part of the job? Plus, if no one person can understand all the parts of a large, complex system, why even try? Now, for some people, admitting that you're having trouble figuring out some code is basically like admitting that you're having trouble doing your job. So if you see a class that you have to really puzzle over before you understand what it's doing and why, it doesn't feel like a problem with the code. It feels like a problem with you. And the human language parallel here does not help you. Because if you're trying to read an article in a language you've only been studying for a year or two, you're going to struggle through slowly. While your friend, who's been studying diligently for 10 years, they're going to skim through it really quickly. They might notice a grammar error. They might laugh at a little play on words. It's clear that the difference in speed to understanding is related to your skill with the language. So you know, sometimes say that you know, they're only going to hire people who are fully fluent. No interns. We're getting area experts only. But I don't know how many of you are trying to hire developers. How many candidates do you get who can actually read and write in the tech stack that you need at an expert level? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even if you find this person who maybe exists, who knows all the syntax and all the libraries, let's say they also <laughs> agree to join your team, the other engineers on your project are busy writing new code all the time, which is effectively adding new vocabulary words to the language constantly. Unless you're mob programming 100% of the time, how are you going to stay perfectly fluent when the vocabulary of the language is changing hour by hour? So OK, you, you've accepted. You can't hire a fully fluent person. But you come back and say, well, a skilled engineer, they're going to figure it out. We don't have to make it easy for them. But when code's easy to read for you, you can be just lazily scanning through something in, in some part of the code base. And one part of your brain will sit up and say, hold the phone. That bit looks wrong. And then the thinking, deciding part of your brain kind of saunters over and says, oh, yeah, this is never going to work asynchronously. We better handle that. But that takes willpower, right, to engage that rational part of your brain. And there's an often cited study that tests subjects' willpower with fresh baked chocolate chip cookies and radishes. Now, subjects are placed in a room uh, with a bowl full of one or the other of the treats and are asked not to eat them. And after 15 minutes, they're asked to solve a difficult puzzle, a maze. Except, surprise, the maze is unsolvable. Now, the subjects who only had to resist the urge to eat radishes worked on the puzzle for an average of 15 to 20 minutes before calling it quits or asking for help. But the subjects who had to resist eating the chocolate lasted maybe eight minutes before giving up. And they were much grumpier when they did, too. <laughs> I remember one time sitting in the back seat of a car being driven home from a weekend at the beach by a couple of French friends. Uh, we'd been all speaking French all weekend with no problems. But when I was sitting there in the back seat of this warm car, I was a little drowsy. The conversation was just on the edge of hearing. And I relaxed back into the seat, and the words just became this soothing, nonsensical sound washing over me. Now, you've probably had this experience in, say, a long code review, where you start out going strong because you really care about this sweeping change to the data processing layer, but halfway through, your eyes glaze over and your posture changes, and you have to really will yourself to keep reading at least just the method signatures to make sure that it all makes sense. And now, after you've finished not doing an amazing job on that code review, you've actually used up enough willpower that there's a good chance that it's going to be more difficult to focus on the next task you have to do. You might give up after eight minutes and say it's impossible. It can't be done. So if your engineers are always deciphering, they're going to be exhausted. Uh, and they're going to miss basic stuff. In that poem earlier, how likely would you have been to notice a syntax error? Like, you know, you, you want to offload as much as you can to that snap judgment part of your teammates' brains. The part that just knows that, oh, yesterday I thinked something new is not correct English. Paying close attention, it takes an enormous amount of energy and willpower, and those are finite for everyone. So let's imagine that you believe this, that decipherable code is not enough, that we're really striving for readability, and we're thinking hard about our readers. It can be hard to know what to do. You understand the code you wrote, right? How can you predict what will make it easy or hard for a reader, maybe someone that you haven't even met? 
we can take a, a clue from our interactions with non-native speakers of our language, because we're used to changing our speech when we talk to people who are communicating in their second or third language. We can learn a lot from those behaviors when we think about code. For example, you stop using so many idioms and slang. Instead of, oh, you rock my socks. Like, ma'am, are your feet OK? Like, no, you are really great. In code, you're not going to use in-joke sorts of names. Release the hounds. I don't know what that does. Choose names as straightforwardly as you can. Begin, app, setup, network requests. Another example, you'll enunciate clearly. American English Pronunciation 101. If someone says, Gchat, that means, did you eat yet? In code, enunciating clearly, you know, it might mean that you introduce some intermediate variables to label the steps of a calculation. You don't need them. I've gotten that comment on code review. You know you could do this in one line. I know. Um, but this is coming actually as close as you can to taping that warning label to the handle of your tool, because this extra label means that anyone who uses the result will know exactly what it's for. Uh, you'll also introduce regional dialect slowly. Like, y'all come back now. Like, what, did I forget something? No, <laughs> that means I hope you visit again. In code, that means you might decide to wait to introduce things like custom operators. I'm not saying never use them ever, but think about non-native speakers in your programming environment before you introduce them everywhere. My favorite technique for readable code, though, is using patterns. Because people can learn almost any pattern. English speakers, we learn plural rules for child to children, woman to women, sheep to sheep. Uh, French, German, Hindi languages all have gendered nouns, and of course they're not the same <laughs> genders in those different languages, but fluent speakers use the right ones without a second thought. We are totally capable of developing an intuitive grasp of patterns even when those patterns make no sense. But please don't make us work that hard for your code. It's so much easier for us to group things together and chunk them when things that act the same look the same. So you can help us pattern match by being as parallel as you possibly can for a very small example in code. This code is simple. It's just setting up some variables. But even so, it's kind of hard to scan effectively. The only difference between these two variables is that one is good and the other is bad, but you have to read the whole variable name to figure that out. But look how your eyes here pick out how the different shapes when the beginnings there all line up. There's more code here. It's easier to tell at a glance what's going on. And this is why some people get really excited about formatting and lining up the equal signs or the colons and method calls, because look at how much easier even this is to scan and understand. You can use this, this pattern recognition not just at the line level, though, but at the file and the function level. Have you heard of the squint test? You close your eyes almost all the way and just look through your eyelashes at the screen so you can get an idea of the structure of the code without all that pesky implementation detail getting in the way. I'll show you an example. This is fuzzy on purpose. Don't worry. Um, if you can't see, that's the point. Uh, you can probably decide right away which parts look similar, what seems to be action, what seems to be setting up. You probably can't even tell what language this is, but you can pick apart the different patterns. Our recognition of patterns, though, it can work against us. Uh, it can serve as camouflage. I want to introduce you to the character that I hate the most out of all the characters in code, the bang. You know what? Characters look pretty much exactly the same. These are all tall, thin, single vertical lines. Except one of these characters means, oh, by the way, the opposite of whatever it was you were trying to say. And now in Swift, this, this is actually nicknamed the crash operator because it, here it is force unwrapping and optional. In case you're not familiar with what that means, it means that you, the developer, have taken something that the compiler knows might be nil but you're saying, no, 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 don't worry about it, it's fine. If it's not fine, we'll just find out when we crash at runtime, it's okay. <laughs> so someone here decided that portents of ill will definitely exists, it so obviously exists, it's okay to kick your user right out of your app if it doesn't, and you, the reader, you might not pick up on this danger sign because it happens to be sandwiched between other tall, thin characters. So, if your engineering team is trying to name a key part of your model that's importantly distinct from all the rest, name it in a way that makes it stand out from the crowd. 
So it used patterns to help people read, take code that serves similar roles, make it look similar, and that's gonna help us develop that intuition so someday, sooner, we'll be able to understand your code without drawing down all of our energy. Uh, but how do you know which patterns are gonna be helpful and which will be headaches? Uh, which is gonna be the, like, just learn Haskell bit of advice. Uh, it comes down to knowing your audience, knowing your readers. You remember that uh, French story from earlier? Who here speaks French really confidently? Okay, uh, who here was kind of able to follow what was happening? Ah, see, I was pretty sure that you would follow that story for the same reasons that I was pretty sure that my, uh, that my students would understand it. I know that you are really fluent English speakers. This is a whole conference in English. Uh, I had enough background in French that I could choose the French cognates that French speakers are likely to recognize. So learn who your readers are and aim your writing right at them. But I would also challenge you to go further because if you want to write things people can read, you also have to believe your readers. You, you have to believe people when they tell you that your code is unclear and that can be humbling. On a recent project, I submitted a pull request to add this property to a class. I needed it because the interactor's life cycle needed to match the life cycle of the object that created it, but the interactor was instantiated in a local scope as part of a big old side effect, and then uh, the interactor just got injected into a third object. So my quick fix here assigned the interactor to a local property on the object that created it before the function returned and everything passed out of scope. It fixed a crash in a hacky way. No one looking casually at that property, though, is going to have any idea why the object cares about it. So it's got a strong risk of being deleted by some good citizen who comes through and, and cleans it up. So I added a comment. Keep a reference to this interactor as long as the tab bar controller is alive. And I got code review feedback. Uh, could you please explain why this is being stored here? Um, I, I did. It's, it's right there. I said it very clearly. But I had to take a step back and remember my own advice. If the person reading it does not understand it, you did not say it clearly. It doesn't matter how clear it is to you. It doesn't matter how clear it is to your friend that you show it to that evening and say, this makes sense, right? Because your friend is not your audience. So I updated the comment and asked the team if it worked. Yep, perfect, makes sense. Great. I thought it made sense before, but you know what? Before, it made sense to me. And now it makes sense to the whole team. It's really humbling. Now, sometimes when someone asks if our code is unclear, we want to respond by, uh, when someone says that our code is unclear, we want to respond by asking questions like this kind of rhetorically. What's wrong with them? Why? We think they're just not trying hard enough. Maybe we think they're not smart enough. I have sometimes caught myself thinking this at myself, which is both uncomfortable and unproductive. The more data-seeking way to phrase this, though, is what information are they missing that's making it hard to read this code? This question works on both your teammates and yourself. If you think about your teammate's background, that helps to you to write code that takes advantage of their particular experiences. And on the other side, when you yourself are very confused while you're reading some code, this question, oh, what information am I reading, helps you focus on what you need instead of on how painful it is when you don't understand some code. So you write readable code by treating your and your teammate's confusion as data. So that is some advice for how to write readable code. Be empathetic to your teammates' needs. Listen to them when they say they're having trouble understanding. And most importantly, be predictable. We are so good at recognizing patterns, but it really helps us if you are consistent enough that we can do it. But Let's be honest, it is not always feasible to write code that's geared towards the least fluent team member. We're, we're trying to ship some software here, right? Uh, this code has been attributed to a lot of different people. I think Mark Twain, everybody, Mark Twain has said everything, right? Um, I'm sorry for the long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. As it turns out, writing simple, clear code is really difficult. It can take more time than you have when you're up against a deadline. Even if you've got no deadline, it's your own personal project. It can take more skill than you have. It's hard to write for these two simultaneous audiences, the, the computer and the humans. So that brings us to the final question, when? When do you work hard to make something readable? 
And when is it okay to instead ask your teammates to spend down their energy to understand? The, the folks who landed the Mars rover have a coding guideline that I love, that code shouldn't be arguably but obviously correct in the most important parts of your app. If you put code that your teammates can't easily read in the mission critical parts of your app, that's like uh, putting a, piles of boxes in, the, in a fire escape on, in, in like, in, on, when people are trying to get out of the building. Even if you know that this building is an Olympic track and field training gym, let's say, you know the athletes can jump over and around all these boxes, you don't want them to have to when they're fleeing a fire. And because you remember that readability it requires a reader, mission critical code shouldn't just be obviously correct to you, the one who wrote it, Ms. Purple, but to the majority of your team. It has to be clear to your audience and they're the ones who will tell you if your efforts worked. You've probably had conversations before and you will have conversations again about whether some code is readable and whether it matters. Your company's trying to ship a feature while the engineering team is holding out for that big refactor. And I hope that I've given you some concrete reasons why folks sometimes strongly prefer code that they can read. So take these ideas with you to that next discussion. Talk to your teams about cognitive overhead, about working memory. Identify your critical code paths and maybe say, you know, nobody understands this and that is okay. Figure out what tools the team might need to decipher because if we're deciphering all day, good tools make a world of difference and figure out what, what patterns we could use to develop intuitions so that your team members can all be fluently reading. And hopefully, then, your teammates will hopefully agree on, on these principles and you will get to use all that extra energy, these cognitive resources that you have freed up to tackle and solve much more interesting problems. You will get to decipher less and create more. And that is the end, thank you. Time for questions and answers. Surprise! If, <laughs> if you, if anyone has any questions for Laura. Also, my favorite format for for questions is uh, talking in small groups later. So um, <laughs> please talk to me about those sorts of things. I'll come back to you. I know you touched on this briefly, but just mm. thoughts on how to determine which skill sets, which Haskell language to invest in bringing a whole team up to speed on to kind of give the whole team a leg up in expressiveness. Uh, that, that's, I, as you, I think you mentioned, it's, it's hard to answer in general. I, I would want to be very sure uh, what problem we were trying to solve by requiring this new skill. Um, if I've worked on multiple teams where everybody started using something that had a, a really steep learning curve just because the person who wrote code the fastest was really excited about a new framework. Um, that is, is not, <laughs> that, that's not a good metric for making that decision. Uh, I, I would love to see examples from teams, maybe the, the before and after, who say, hey, we started using this and here is measurably how it has helped us be more productive. I know that, I forget which company it was that decided to walk back on using React Native because they said, you know what, we wanted it to, to make us faster and it was the new thing and at the end of the day, it, it kind of didn't. So I'd, I'd want to definitely have some, some evidence that it had made a team faster and better outside of, of these toy examples. But that's also something that I've noticed is, can be a real challenge when you've got a team of people in a variety of family situations because sometimes maybe you've got 
a lot of folks who are single, who don't have, don't have kids, who are so excited about the, all the new stuff that they're like, yeah, I am working all the evenings and weekends to contribute stuff back to this new framework. And so I understand it really well. And you can just do that too, right? And it's, if your company isn't willing to invest time during the day for, for your engineers to ramp up on this, if, you, if your whole plan is everybody's just going to spend their weekends learning, I, I would question the health of that company. Yeah, you have another question? Est-ce que ce serait une bonne idée de compiler une liste d'exemples de codes lisibles et de mettre cette, ces exemples à la disposition des, des, des gens, que ce soit des, des programmeurs nouveaux ou des programmeurs expérimentés? Yeah. So if, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Speaking of uh, comprehensibility, um, it, uh, having a, uh, examples of readable code that, that new programmers can go and look at so they can kind of pattern match on that. One of my favorite tools for this is actually a website called Exorcism, E-X-E-R-C-I-S-M, uh, that its goal is to teach new programmers in a language how to write idiomatic versions of that language. As I think their, uh, one of their bylines is, you can write Fortran in any language. Um, but when, and when you submit your, uh, your toy, when you submit your solutions to various problems on this website, the feedback that you get is, hey, in Go, here's how we capitalize comments. You say like, but it doesn't matter. I got the answer. Like, it, no, it does matter. You're trying to learn to become a fluent developer in this language, not just to make the bits spit out the right answer. Oh, yeah, thanks for asking. Do you, while, while we have a couple minutes, um, I, I am curious if, if you have stories or, I mean, this is the, I'm, I'm inviting, like, so this is really more of a comment. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what kind of stories do you have about times that you've either made code more readable and had that had a good effect on your team? Or if you want to get some support of, like, oh, my gosh, are you, I, I encountered this code that was completely unreasonable. Yes, yes, we are here for you, Marco. <laughs> I've seen that you use camel case a lot, mm. and um, we started using underscores instead of camel case, um, which looked weird for the programmers at first, but so you could go with reflection and say, replace underscore with a space, or a double underscore with a colon, so you could actually be able to write correct grammar, and then have a two-string method of everything. So if you have value types, just spit out the name and the properties. If you have method calls, just spit them out while the program is running. And then you get a clear human readable text form of the running program. And that's kind of super beautiful. And it was a perfect debug help. So programmers actually get used to writing like this. And now we don't see the underscore anymore. And the underscore seems more like a space. And in German specifically, we write German domain code. Uh, capital and non-capital letters have a different meaning. So a verb and a noun can have totally different meanings if you have big letters or not. So camel case is always kind of misleading. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the one thing that changed the way we write code. Now it reads more like prose than like technical instructions. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's a really good point because there are languages that literally do not have capital and lowercase letters. Uh, so yeah, that could get extra complicated if everything's run together. That's awesome. What other ideas? Yeah. Um, so Visual Studio has this concept of regions that you can set up within your code. So you can just hashtag region, and then you can collapse regions. And when I first learned about it, I'm like, OK, this is a cool way to group code. Um, but a more senior person was like, it's kind of cool, but it's also a way that you can get yourself in trouble. Because if you're creating a lot of regions within a file, that might be a sign that that file is too big. Well, recently I was going through our legacy code base, and I hit this file where you're on line, say, 30, and then you collapse the region, and the next line is 2030. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I discovered why regions can be bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that as a, as a symptom of, wow. 
I selfishly want, want another really good idea for making code more readable. Yes. So this isn't anything super mind blowing, it's just a, a sort of recent experience we had going back um, to code that was written, I don't know, three or four years ago, um, wanting to reuse kind of that model. Um, and at the time, the, the team had spent a lot of time um, focusing on test coverage, but at the same time making the test extremely readable and extremely descriptive in terms of what the intent was and what the kind of, basically we, we put a lot of effort in making the test expressive in terms of the domain language. Um, so it kind of helped to go back through those and sort of re-understand re -understand what the code was doing. On the flip side though, there were, there were places in the code where the language wasn't exactly fleshed out. So the code was hard to read, but the test kind of assisted in nice. understanding what the code was, was doing. So I don't know if it's kind of a good and a bad case. Well, it sounds like a case of uh, shoring up the, the difficult case with like a, a real example, like as a nice little gift for future you. I love that. So you've had it, yes. So one of my early mentors uh, said that his readable code test was, was the wife test. If his wife could read it, then it was readable. His wife was a nurse, so. Okay, yeah, that, that kind of hurts my heart. But yes, if your non-programming partner, let's say, can read it, that's, uh, that's great. <laughs> I love it. Well, that, we are exactly at 4.15, so thank you. I'm so glad that I got the chance to learn from you all. <laughs>